Well, this time children, preschool to kindergarten are dismissed for Children's Church. And as they're going, I invite you to turn with me once again in your Bibles to Matthew's Gospel, the 8th chapter. And as they're going, let us be praying for God's blessing as we look into his word this morning. Father, we do thank you so much for your word. Father, we are told that these are not idle words. These are our life, because they are life-giving, life-sustaining words. Lord, we would ask that as we look into the pages of your word, we ask that you would cause your Holy Spirit to speak through it. Father, we would ask that you would give us ears that are attentive, ears that recognize your voice speaking to us today. Father, that's our prayer that you would have something to say to each and every person in this place today. And Father, we know that that is not too big of a task for you because we know that nothing is impossible. So Lord, give us ears to hear as your spirit speaks. Father, give us receptive and responsive hearts this day. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, some years ago, I was introduced to the English poet and hymn writer named William Cooper. Cooper lived from 1731 to 1800, and he counted among his his friends and the influences upon his life, John Newton, who was a poet and uh, hymn writer in his own right, having given us Amazing Grace as his most famous work. Cooper's life wasn't an easy life. In fact, in many ways, he was challenged throughout his life. In fact, at one point, he was institutionalized for insanity. After that, he returned to the roots of his Christian faith. But even after that, throughout his life, he he battled with bouts of depression. His most famous work was titled Light Shining Out of Darkness. And... That poem gave us these memorable words, and perhaps for some of you, many of you, these would be familiar words. As he wrote, God moves in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Cooper's words, written at a time when his heart could not see clearly the hand of God at work in his life, nevertheless came that those words came from the pen of a follower of Christ who numbered himself among those he describes as fearful saints. He he would describe himself, he would take ownership, as at times being a fearful saint, a follower of Christ. And he calls himself, and he calls his readers, and he calls every follower of Jesus to fresh courage take. See, sometimes the, at least for me, I'll speak for myself this morning, sometimes the living of life spawns fear, even as a follower of Jesus. And life becomes, for the Christian, a a mixture of both faith and fear. And sometimes that mixture becomes lean on faith and rich. In fear. At least that's been my experience, and maybe you've been there as well. Well, the first century disciples of Jesus knew what it was to at times be rich in fear. And one of those occasions occurred when they were on a boat with Jesus. A storm came up, like the, the likes of which even the most seasoned fishermen among Jesus' twelve apostles who were on the boat with him. A a storm that they had never seen the likes of. And they feared 
for their lives. The boat on that occasion was not filled with a haul of fish, but it was filled with a boatload of fearful saints. It was in that moment, in that storm, when their faith, the mixture of their faith, ran lean and their fears ran rich. And it was in the midst of that storm that they heard Jesus asking them a question. That, that's what we've been looking over at the last several weeks. Jesus asking, questions that Jesus asks his disciples. We, we heard Jesus asking, why are you anxious? And we heard Jesus asking, why do you see the speck in your own eye, or why do you see the speck in the eye of others and overlook the log in your own eye? And we heard Jesus asking the question, why do you call me Lord, Master, and not do what I tell you to do? And the, the question that arose out of this boat ride what was this. Why are you afraid? Why is the mixture of your faith and fear leaning so heavily towards fear? Well, well as for us, just as for Jesus' first century followers... Our fears which arise when life storms arise can, can all too easily squelch our trust in Jesus. This morning in our text, in, in this story, the short account of a boat ride with Jesus, we, we see three reasons why faith should always prevail over fear for the follower of Jesus Christ. So let's take a look at that this morning. Uh, the, the first thing that we notice from our text is, is that faith should prevail over fear for the Christian because Jesus is with us when storms arise. Jesus is with us. The, the flow of our text, verses 23 to 27, actually has its impetus. It's beginning in verse 18. There we see, now, now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. There was a crowd of people that were following Jesus and, and they were taxed from the, the, the service they were rendering and giving and the ministry they were having. And Jesus understands his own uh, energy slipping and that of his disciples and he, and he wants to divest themselves of the crowd and he wants to get into the boat and go to the other side just for a bit of respite, a bit of refreshment. Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he, he gave orders to go to the other side, the other side of the lake, the Sea of Galilee. And to get there would require a boat ride. So they are headed to the boat and, and trying to disengage themselves from the crowd. But there are a couple of people who, who came up to Jesus. They were interested in Jesus enough to, to express a desire. They wanted to become his follower too. They wanted to become his disciple. But oddly enough, Jesus doesn't encourage him. He's, he didn't say, hey, yeah, get on the boat with us. Yeah, sure, follow me. Instead, he says, a scribe came up to him and, and, and said, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, come on board. No, he didn't say that. And Jesus said to him, well, foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus tells this would-be follower, it's not easy to follow me. There are sacrifices to be made. Do you still want to be my follower? It says another of disciples, and there, when we see that word disciples, we need to understand it in the most general and broadest of its meanings, of the meanings of that word. Here, here was an individual who had been following Jesus, literally around, listening to what he had to say. And, and now he wants to up his follower game, his disciple game. And he wants to go deeper and he wants to go farther with Jesus. And, and this gentleman said, Lord, I want to be your disciple. Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Let me take care of things. Let me wrap up some loose ends. I'll catch up with you later. And Jesus said to him, follow me, and leave the dead to bury their own dead. To him, Jesus says that following Jesus is life's primary. It's not a secondary relationship. It is life's primary 
calling and relationship. Following Jesus is to take priority and precedence over everything and everyone else. So, so it appears that these disciple wannabes ended up being disciple not wannabes because they hang back. And Jesus moved toward the boat and they didn't move with him. And, and then we pick up our text and, and when he got into the boat... His disciples followed him. Jesus got into the boat, and being true disciples, Peter, James, and John, and the rest of the 12 apostles, they didn't hold back, they didn't hang back, they stayed with Jesus, and they got in the boat with him. They followed him onto the boat. And though they didn't realize it at the moment, they were not only following Jesus into the boat, they were following Jesus into a storm. Now, I don't know for sure, but I suspect that Jesus knew a storm was a coming, even if the disciples were caught off guard by the storm. I don't think Jesus was. I think he knew exactly what was on the horizon. Sometime later, the Apostle John records an occasion when Jesus is teaching about the relationship between Jesus and those who are his followers. And to help explain that relationship, he utilizes the imagery of shepherds and sheep. In John chapter 10, verse 3 and 4, Jesus told his disciples and his would-be disciples, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and leads them out. He goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Now, I can't help but wonder that as Jesus is talking, the, the disciples who were on the boat earlier were looking at each other with a sort of a, a, a knowing look and maybe a little chuckle, a little grin. Yeah, sometimes he leads into a boat. And sometimes we follow him into a storm. But whether fair weather or foul weather, Jesus' disciples knew that Jesus would always be with them. That is the last word of Matthew's gospel, isn't it? Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. Jesus said to his disciples, Behold, I am with you always the very end of the age. You get in the boat with me and I will be with you through time and eternity. So faith should always prevail over fear for the follower of Christ because we know that Jesus is with us when storms arise. But the second thing we notice from this text is this, that faith should prevail over fear because Jesus doesn't worry when storms arise. Storms blow in. Jesus doesn't worry about it. Again, our text. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea. That, that word storm, that word great, it's the same word that's used in the New Testament to describe earthquakes. It's a common word for earthquakes. Recall when Jesus hung on the cross, everything grew dark, and there was a great earthquake, so great that the temple, the veil in the temple was torn in two. It was an earthquake. And behold, there, was there arose a great storm. It was a shaking storm storm on the waters. It was a violent storm that shook the boat. So the boat was being swamped, covered literally, by waves. Water is pouring into the boat, and the wind is howling. But he, Jesus, was asleep. They are sinking 
and Jesus is sleeping. And they, they being those who had been foolish enough to follow Jesus into the boat, and though they who didn't hold back and hang back and, and say, yeah, no, maybe, maybe not this Jesus thing for me. And they who had followed Jesus into the boat, all of a sudden those who had hung back seemed far the wiser than those who had gotten into the boat with Jesus. And, and sometimes I think we're tempted to believe that it would be better had we not gotten into the boat with Jesus. Ever feel like that? And they, those who had gotten in the boat with Jesus, they went and woke him, saying. So, so get this picture in mind. Here is this shaking storm. The boat is rattling back and forth. The winds are blowing. Water is pouring over the sides of the boat. They're standing knee-deep in water, and, <laughs> and they see Jesus sleeping, and, and they begin talking about themselves. Well, should we wake him? Uh, well, what, what do we do? What's, and, and so very slowly, perhaps, and, and gingerly and quietly, they, they go up to Jesus and sort of shake his shoulder a little bit. And, and uh, they try and, and then he, he begins to rouse just a little bit. And so they, they say something like this, uh, Jesus. We, we hate to bother you, but, Jesus, we, we have a situation here. You, you see, while you've been sleeping, there's been a whale of a storm which has whipped up. And, 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 well, you see this water we're standing in? It's not supposed to be there. I know you're not a fisherman. I know you're a carpenter. But, but this isn't right, okay? And, and, Jesus, do you notice that the boat is rocking back and forth and going up and down over the waves? Well, Jesus, that's a problem. And, and Jesus, we're wondering if you can help us out here. Is that how it went down? That's not how it went down. What they said was short and to the point. Save us, Lord. We are perishing. Actually, in the Greek language, it's actually just three words. Lord, save Doomed. <laughs> I mean, that's what they were saying. Lord, save. They, they couldn't even articulate full sentences at that point. Lord, save. Doomed. And he said to them. Now, I, I, I picture Jesus laying there, only opening up a single eye, perhaps a bit annoyed that his slumber had been disturbed. And, you know, I got to thinking, what could have Jesus done? Jesus, having been awoken, he could have looked around, and he could have jumped overboard, and he could have ran across the water and saved himself, right? He could have, but he didn't. And he, he said to them, Why are you afraid? Oh, you have little faith. Why? Well, it's clear to everyone here but you, Jesus, that we're about to die. Jesus, you have no clue what's going on here. Jesus' response, I think, would have been, I have no clue. <laughs> you have no clue. As fear trumped their faith in that moment. And I stress, in that moment, these were followers of Jesus. They, their faith in Jesus was growing all the time. But in that moment, in that storm, fear trumped their faith. And for a moment, as the winds were howling, as the boat was shaking, they set aside for the moment everything that they had learned about Jesus and seen in Jesus. In that moment, they weren't taking to heart the comfort that they had and should have derived from their past experience with Jesus. And, and rather than being encouraged by the presence of Jesus, they were overlooking the presence of Jesus in that moment. 
And he, they were forgetting the promises that Jesus had made to them in that moment. And in that moment, they were forgetting the love and the care that Jesus had always shown them. Where is your faith? Why are you afraid, Jesus asked. I've always told my kids, and I usually tell them when storms are outside the house blowing, the wind is whipping, and, and uh, there's, there's uh, announcements on the, the TV, you know, take cover, tornadoes coming. And, and it's, it's usually when storms arise that in an attempt to lessen their fears, I always tell them, you don't need to worry until you see me worried. When you see me worried, then you can worry. What I'm trying to convey to them and assure them is that I have a handle on what's going on. I know what's going on and that they can trust me to make decisions that have their best interest in mind. That day on the sea... The disciples didn't see Jesus worried and filled with fear. But rather, they saw Jesus calm. Yet they bypassed faith and went straight to fear. And that day Jesus said, you know, if you don't see me worried, you don't have to worry. And if Jesus isn't worried when storms arise in our lives, we don't need to worry either. And third thing we see here, that faith should prevail over fear because Jesus is in control when storms arise. Look again at our text. And he said to them, why are you afraid, O oh, you of little faith? Jesus has by now opened his eyes, but, but rather than seeing the situation and jumping to his feet like I would have done, I, I got to thinking of the Christmas uh, rhyme, he sprang from his bed to see what was the matter. That's what I would have done. Jesus didn't do that. He, he, he opened his eyes, and he, he looks around, and, and calmly he asks his question, while still laying down. He hasn't gotten up yet. There is no worry. There is no alarm. There is no panic in Jesus. Again, look what it says. And Jesus said to him, he, he has one eye open. Well, why are you afraid? Oh, you have little faith. Then, I mean, he's not in any hurry here. Then he rose, got up, and rebuked the wind and the sea, and there was great calm. The great storm became great calm. Jesus is said to have, it says in the text, rebuked the wind and sea. Jesus exercised his authority over the wind and the sea. Jesus exercised control over that which in the ancient world was thought to be evil and chaotic and uncontrollable. And Jesus brought the wind and the waves to its knees with three short words recorded in Mark's gospel. Peace. Be still. In the Old Testament, the power of God is often demonstrated and expressed through his authority over the seas and his ability to control it. The psalmist writes in Psalm 89, verses 8 and 9, O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord? With your faithfulness all around you, who is like you? Who is as strong as you? Who is as faithful as you? You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. Uh, again, in the ancient world, the, the seas, they, they were the embodiment of chaos, of that which was uncontrollable, of evil. In fact, that's why you go to the book of Revelation, and it says, 
and there was no sea. There was no evil. There is no chaos. It is all under God's sovereign control. Recall last week we, we heard Jesus rightfully commanding obedience to himself. Because he's God. He says, why don't you do what I tell you? Prophets, rabbis, they said, why don't you have to do what God tells you? Jesus says, you have to do what I tell you. He, he was implying, because I'm God. And in our present text, we see Jesus not sounding like God, but acting like God. Controlling the seas and causing them to be still. Because he is ruler. Because he is God. And notice the disciples' response. And the men marveled. The men marveled. Matthew is writing this as a first-hand witness. He was in the boat with Jesus. And remember earlier he wrote that his disciples followed him into the boat. Now Matthew writes... And the men who were in the boat, the same men, earlier called disciples, here they're called men. And the men marveled. Why? Why did earlier he call them disciples, now he's calling them men? Now I don't know for sure, but I think Matthew is demonstrating his growing understanding of the difference between Jesus and and his disciples. See, Jesus is not just a man, though he's fully man and fully God. Jesus is not just a man on spiritual steroids. He is an altogether different category. And the men in the boat marveled at the divine one in the boat, saying, What sort of of man is this. He is not at all like us. And, and this is more an exclamation than a question. What sort of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? This is not a man like us. In college, I had my first experience with uh, uh, an SLR single lens reflex camera. And it was a camera like this, a Minolta SRT 101. It was the first camera I ever had in my hands that wasn't fixed focus. Every other camera I'd ever had, you had a little Kodak Instamatic. Anybody ever have a Kodak Instamatic camera? You know, you just point and shoot. Well, this was the first time, as I was taking a publication workshop class, that I ever had in my hands a camera that you had to turn the focus ring in order to bring things into focus. The image that I would see in the viewfinder would start out blurred until I turned the focusing ring on the lens and the, then the image would become clear. The image didn't start sharply focused. It became sharply focused. Now, it's fascinating for me to watch the disciples' image and understanding of Jesus become ever more sharply focused as they walk with Jesus, as they live life with Jesus. Every so often, the, the, the focusing ring of the disciples would turn just a bit, and they would see, they would understand him with greater clarity. And for those disciples, Jesus calming the storm and lovingly saving their bacon, that was a focusing moment. They had many of those moments along the way, and honestly, they didn't really, Jesus never came into sharp, crystal clear focus for them until after the resurrection. Then, okay, now we see the big picture. But that day on the Sea of Galilee, they came to see Jesus in a deeper light, in a sharper focus as one who controls the storm that was so faith-reducing and fear-fueling for them. 
Now, with Jesus calming the storm, and the disciples seeing more clearly the divinity of Jesus, who he was, we could easily assume and surmise that the story is finished. End of story, the truth has been told, and hopefully the lesson was learned and taken to heart by the disciples. But the story is not quite over just yet. One more verse, actually one more phrase from one more verse, brings the account to conclusion. And when he came to the other side, Jesus got his followers, Jesus got those who were in the boat with him to their destination. He got them to where he wanted them to be. Yes, it had been a rough ride. Yes, it had been through a storm, but they came out on the other side safe and secure from all alarm. Their faith, at least for the moment, was the richer and the deeper because of the storm. And their fear was leaner and littler. Any storms raging around you this morning? I imagine that by now you're saying, yeah, here's my storm. Yeah, here's what, what's causing my mixture of faith and, and uh, fear to, to be lean on faith and rich in fear. Yeah, I know exactly what storm I'm dealing with. Maybe we need to take a seat with Jesus on the bench, like we have in the past few weeks. Maybe we need to hear him asking as I've heard him asking myself, Neil, why are you afraid? What answer would I, would I give Jesus? What answer would you give Jesus? Well, I might say something like this. Well, well Jesus, this storm that I'm in is, is too big for even you to control. Jesus, this storm is bigger, more powerful than you. Or I, I might say something like this. Jesus says, Neil, why are you afraid? And, and I might say something like, well, I'm, I'm afraid because it, it feels like you're asleep when I need you. I want you to do something. Jesus, it just doesn't feel to me like you care. Or, or maybe Jesus would say, Neil, why are you so afraid? And I might find myself saying, well, I, I'm afraid because I don't see any way this turns out well. I, I don't see any way of coming out on the other side of this storm. I don't see any way of getting to the other side. How might Jesus answer based on this text? Maybe we could hear Jesus saying something like, Neil, you're my follower. You followed me into the boat. And I haven't abandoned ship. I haven't jumped over the side and screwed across the water away from you. Neil, I'm in the boat with you regardless of what you may be feeling or thinking. Neil, we're in this storm together. You are not alone. Behold, I am with you always. And I will be with you to the end of the storm and to the end of your life and to the end of eternity. And maybe we'd hear Jesus saying something like, well, Neil, I'm not worried. So you don't, need to be, you don't need to worry either. I've got this. I'm in control. I'll get you to the other side of the storm because I am the Son of God. I am your Savior. And Neil, I am your friend. The question is, is he your Savior? Is he your friend? Are you in the boat with Jesus? Because that's the best place to be at all times, and especially in the storms. Well, I pray that each and every one of you have placed your faith in Christ and are trusting that his death on the cross was purchased for you, the forgiveness of your sins, and a place in God's family. And if you've yet to follow Jesus into the boat, may this be the day that you trust in him so that you need not be afraid. Because Jesus, your Savior, and friend is with you. Oh, may our lives be rich 
in faith. As every day we get up in the morning, and every day as Jesus' disciple, we choose to get into the boat with him. And as we ride with him through the storm, we can have confidence that he will bring us safely to the other side. Because that's what a Savior does. And that's what a friend does. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for the truths of your word. Father, we thank you that Jesus is Savior and friend to all who turn to him. Father, I pray that each one here has chosen not to hang back, but has chosen to get into the boat with Jesus. And Father, may we choose that each and every morning as we get out of bed. And Father, we would pray that even though we may not see the storms coming, we thank you that, that you do. And you remain with us. And you're not worried because you're in control. And you will always get your people safely to the other side. Father, we thank you for that assurance and that truth and that promise. Father, encourage us in those moments with this passage when our faith is running lean and our fear is running rich. Father, may we find hope and peace in you. And in Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. The song that we qu conclude with this morning. The, the, the songwriter, he, he's talking to himself. The psalmist, we see the psalmist talking to himself often, don't we? David says, praise the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, praise his holy name. Da David's talking to himself. This songwriter is talking to himself. Because maybe it was written in a time when, when uh, his faith was running lean and his fear was running rich. And so the psalm, songwriter here says to himself, Be still, my soul. The Lord is on thy side. He is your Savior. He's your friend. I, I, I love this second verse of this, this hymn. The writer says, again, talking to himself, Be still, my soul. Thy God doth undertake... To guide the future as he has the past. Thy hope, thy confidence. Let nothing shake. Even if you're in a shaking storm, let, nothing, let not your confidence, not your hope be shaken. All now mysterious, we don't see how we can ever get to the other side. All now mysterious shall be bright at last. Be still, my soul. The waves and winds Still know his voice, who ruled over them while he dwelt here on earth. The winds and the waves, the chaos, they still know his voice. And they listen to his voice. And he is with us to the very end. Would you stand as we sing those words together?
So maybe this week we need to talk to ourselves. Be still, my soul. He's not working. He is with us. And He is in control. And so we can have confidence for each one of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and as friend. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace. You are dismissed.